Here are some quick notes on oscillator strengths to accompany chapter four of To Build a Star. So the textbook works through this semi-classical picture of photon absorption. So the basic idea is that you have a photon of a given frequency comes in, interacts with the atom, and it interacts with the electron in the atom that causes the excitation uh, of the electron from you know, one orbital to another. And the electromagnetic wave is actually oscillating the electron in this picture. So the field strength grows in, grows in one direction and then weakens and then grows in the other and goes up and down. So that's the basic picture is your electrons being disturbed uh, by this electromagnetic field to make the transition happen. And so the, you have an oscillator here. The electromagnetic field is what's driving the oscillator. And then because it's accelerating, um, then you have Larmor radiation is dampening it. So it's a, it's a driven, damped harmonic oscillator. Um, the book, uh, To Build a Star, works through the math and gets the corresponding you know, classical cross-section uh, for this absorption. And uh, what you have is that, uh, as you can see worked out, one over the mean free path at a given frequency. Uh, that is equal to the opacity uh, of your material at a given frequency times the density, which is just equal to the uh, ion density doing the absorber times the cross-section for that photon absorption. And plugging in the semi-classical cross-section that the book works through, you get these two sets of parentheses here. So this is a resonant uh, absorption process. And <clears throat> so that's the semi-classical bit. And then what's added at the end here is an extra factor, uh, this F, um, F factor corresponding to the transition from uh, state N to state M. And this is known as the oscillator strength. So it's basically scaling your actual absorption uh, relative to this uh, semi-classical estimate that you have here. Um, so the way that you could calculate this is either measured based on an opacity measurement or calculated. Uh, when it's calculated, uh, obviously you need quantum mechanics to do this. You have the energy difference between the states that you're uh, going from and to, uh, degeneracy of the state that you're starting out with, and then the, the main part, the quantum mechanical bit, is you um, calculate the, uh, you, have, you fold the dipole operator right here in this integral where you have um, between your final state and your initial state and take the modulus squared. Um, so it's a dipole operator because the idea is it's dipole radiation causing the transition. And so really the, the challenge is to calculate these wave functions, right? What are the properties of your initial and final states? and doing the, the transitions. And you need some, some sophisticated calculation to, to do this. Uh, one thing that helps is there is a sum rule that the um, if I sum over all final states that I can transition to from a given initial state, that should be equal to n, the number of electrons that are in the atom. And you may be tempted to think that that means any one transition couldn't be greater than n, um, but you need to keep in mind in the sum, um, there are emission um, uh, oscillator strengths as well. So they contribute to the sum, and, so the, and they're negative. So really, it's basically you can think of the sum of all the absorption oscillator strengths should be equal to the number of electrons in the atom, which is kind of neat because then you think about that, that sum rule, um, that this becomes just the number of electrons in the atom, and you multiply that by the number of ions, and so basically it means that the sum, the limiting, you know, that the sum of all these just becomes your classical um, absorption that you'd expect. So <laughs> it's another case where quantum mechanics kind of converges to the uh, classical uh, physics, as we saw in a previous quick notes when we talked about the correspondence principle. Okay, so you can calculate oscillator strengths and at some point you want to confront them with reality. So what you can do is actually measure the opacity of material. So for instance, this is some amazing work that's done at Sandia, where basically you, you create a plasma very briefly with um, very high magnetic fields changed in a special way called a Z-pinch. So this is at the Z-machine. You can briefly generate a plasma around some target material. 
you can send photons through that and then literally just measure the absorption. So, you know, with and without your uh, target material, how many photons make it through. Um, and you can measure that uh, as a function of the wavelength. And so what that gives you if you measure it is you get basically an opacity as a function of wavelength. And what's shown here are some somewhat recent measurements. So the data are the black and then the different other colored uh, lines. These are theoretical calculations. And you can see in some cases uh, the calculations do pretty well, do a pretty good job. The data are kind of on top of the curves here, at least roughly. And in others, uh, it's kind of awful. And this this iron, these iron measurements really made a splash in the past few years. Uh, this recent paper confirmed those, that here the opacities are, are quite off. The measured opacity seems to be a good bit higher than the um, calculated. And this could be in, in part due to incorrect uh, oscillator strengths in these theoretical calculations. It is important to note that the opacities are also different in regions where you uh, do not have uh, contributions from bound-bound transitions, so it, it can't just be oscillator strengths probably. But in any case, um, determining these oscillator strengths is, is very important for determining opacities, and it's still uh, quite an open subject. An example of what kind of problem this can, this can cause, um, uncertainties in oscillator strengths and therefore opacities uh, results in uh, issue with us understanding our own sun, potentially. So there's something called the solar modeling problem. So basically what you can do is you construct a standard solar model using the physics that we've learned about throughout this semester, and, you know, hydrostatic equilibrium, nu uh, nuclear physics that we'll talk about in, in a little bit, and atomic physics that we've uh, covered here in the past few quick notes. And basically you plug all of this in and you can get things like the central temperature of the sun, the density as a function of radius, temperature as a function of radius, um, the helium mass fraction at the surface, things like that. So you get the standard solar model and you can confront this with other observations. So for instance, you can confront this with so-called helioseismology. So what helioseismology is, is you're looking at the propagation of sound waves through the sun, and the way you, where you get that information is looking at oscillations on the surface. So at some point, maybe in a math methods class, you looked at patterns for a standing wave, maybe on the surface of a drum. This is something you can do analytically. Well, you can also have standing waves in, uh, in a sphere, and the oscillation patterns here are gonna relate to the structure of the, the object, the structure of the sun. And so you take these helioseismological uh, data and you confront it with the standard solar model and they don't uh, agree really. So this is the difference in sound speed between helioseismology data and standard solar model divided by the sound speed for the helioseismology results. And so, so what you expect is uh, zero for perfect agreement. You can see this black curve agrees relatively well. Um, the sound speed is a function of radius, so the standard solar model, except for the issue is this is using an old uh, metallicity or metal composition of the sun. The more recent results are quite discrepant. Okay, you can do the same thing looking at just something as simple as the density as a function of radius for the sun. And you can see old metallicity kind of agrees, the newer metallicity results seem to not agree. Um, so where do these metallicities come from? These are solar abundances. They're actually mostly not from observations of the sun. They're mostly from measurements of meteorites. So the idea is you have, you know, meteorites are material that was also around when the solar system formed, and you can use these to get um, solar abundances. So what also goes in the standard solar model calculations is you have these um, calculated, mostly calculated, and some measured opacities. And so, for instance, determining oscillator strength is important. You need that to determine the opacity and to uh, construct your standard solar model. And so potentially, some of this disagreement maybe has to do with oscillator strengths. The iron data that I showed on the previous slide, that goes some of the way to improving the agreement between these, but not all the way.
Uh, one last thing I want to note about the standard solar model is it's also slightly discrepant with solar neutrino fluxes. Um, so that the solar neutrino flux is related to nuclear physics data as well as the uh, core temperature. And so there is some tension um, there. And another interesting tension between these models and something you get from helioseismological data is the boundary between where you have convective heat transport and radiative heat transport, which we'll talk about in a couple of chapters. So um, this is an interesting problem that we currently don't understand the structure of the sun. And because I like these notes to be evergreen, but this is going to date this, uh, I'm talking about this in September of 2020. So potentially this, you know, at some point this will be solved and it won't be a problem, but for now it's a pretty interesting problem in astrophysics. And that is it for these quick notes on oscillator strengths.